CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I don't know about you... But to me, there is no story with a deeper fascination and compelling attraction than one about a haunted house. No matter how often the bells are rung, there is an infinite variety in the changes. The possible musical combinations in a scale of eight notes are not infinite, but they are wide enough and complex enough to provide more variety than most of us will encounter in a lifetime. We were on our way back to America, but some way down the road, the bridge is out. Ah, tis a most annoying bridge it is. One day there, and then the other but nowhere. Th- th- there must be some way so my daughter and I can continue south. Now, there is a strange thing entirely. Do you know that that's the only bridge that exists anymore? You mean we're... Trapped in this old ruin of a house or castle or whatever it is. As to that, it's up to your honor and herself. Who who are you and what are you? Now that's something else for you to judge. Our mystery drama, A Very Dear Ghost Indeed was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Russell Horton and Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One... the world was a remarkably stable place. In the fall of that year, Mr. William Donovan and his daughter Constance lived through an experience which was to mark the rest of their lives. An experience sheerly accidental and coincidental. Or was it? Well, it's Mr. Donovan's story, not mine, so let him tell it. In the autumn of that last year of the 19th century, business had brought me to Europe and the British Isles. Having traveled so far, and my only daughter being with me, a sudden fancy had taken me to visit the island of my forebears. So it was that Constance and I, having hired a small chaise in preference to taking the public stagecoach, first saw Carrick Moran from high in the mountains on the way from Limerick to Cork. Oh, look, Papa. That lovely big old house, bald in the clearing in the forest, halfway there down the mountain. Isn't it magnificent? With all its turrets and battlements and buttresses. Well, it may have been once, Constance, my dear. (gasps) What's the matter, dear? Oh, 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 nothing, Papa. I am sorry. It just went out of sight. Good heavens, daughter. Don't startle me like that. What? What went out of sight? The castle. But suddenly there was a, a sort of patch of mist came drifting, and the, the whole building seemed to dissolve and disappear into the trees. <laughs> what a romantic you are, my dear. <laughs> Don't you suppose it, it could be haunted or, or some fairy castle like King Arthur? <laughs> well, we're a long way from Camelot. Ah, oh, but we're in the Emerald Isle. The home of bogies and banshees and leprechauns and all kinds of strange magical things. Oh, thank heavens we haven't run into any of them so far. Oh, well, there's the little village. You can see it again. Isn't it quaint? Mm. What happened to your magic castle? Well, we must be down about level with it. I do wish we'd be able to see it up close, and then we... <sighs> well, what is it, Papa? Oh, confound it. Look. That sign. God save you, travelers all. Don't try to cross the bridge. Tis 
dangerous for both man and beast. Oh, damnation. If we can't get across the gorge here, well, let's take this road, turning off to the right. <gasps> Castle Carrick Moran, it says. So it really exists. What do you mean? Well, it, it must be that wonderful old building we saw from higher up in among the trees there. Well, I suppose we haven't much choice. It's the only other road. There must be a bridge of some sort there. Oh, Papa. Suppose there was no place else and we had to spend the night in that lovely old ruin. Now, don't be ridiculous, Constance. We're on the doorstep of the 20th century. Even in this out-of-the-way place, there are some forms of communication. Well, I'm sure you'll handle it, Papa. <laughs> You're always so resourceful. Oh, but it's all terribly romantic and exciting. I have the strangest feeling we're somehow lost in a whole world of yesterday. <laughs> I don't know. Silly horse doesn't want to go through the gates. Is it so far to the house, do you think? Well, it's hard to determine with all these trees shadowing us. I, I wouldn't mind a little walk. Oh, well, we haven't much choice. There isn't any other road. I'm sorry, my dear. I'll tether the horse to the hitching post and let's head for your castle and see if it can produce some magic for us. <laughs> It was a surprisingly long walk through that winding, tree-shadowed lane, like some strange expedition on the bottom of the ocean, so overgrown and darkly shadowed was the carriage path. The house itself, seen close to, was a further, almost chilling shock, all overgrown with vines and lichens. The stones half collapsed on themselves, the mortar dry, crumbling, and running to powdered dust. There was about it a smell of decay, of damp fern and creeping moss, a fetid odor of the dead. The bell pull produced a cracked, rusted sound which brought no answer. We might have abandoned it all. Except that suddenly, out of the darkening mountains, came a driving rainstorm with low, grumbling thunder in the not-so-far distance. There isn't much question it's a deserted ruin, Constance. But still, unless rain has passed, we're more or less sequestered here. Papa, couldn't we go in out of the rain? And I must admit, this portico offers little protection from the weather. Let's see. There isn't. Oh, look, Papa. The cobwebs hanging in the hall and the, the dust on the floor is undisturbed. Yes. <clears throat> well, I doubt if we'll find much help here for our plight. Uh, we better get back to the chairs. Oh, can't we explore it just a little? No, you see, it's, it's far too dangerous. Dangerous? Well, the how? floors are half rotten, my dear, and I don't know how much I'd trust any of the ceilings. Little on the crossbeams. Oh, is that all? Now, what does that mean? I thought... No, it's silly. I just thought you were worried about all the other things. What other things? Well, the things I can't put into words that I feel sort of swirling around me. Voices from the past calling, trying to reach me. Voices from the past? <laughs> Why should they want to speak to you? I don't know. Ooh, it's a creepy sort of feeling. Somehow we're meant to be here. There's something about this place that we ought to know. What on earth is there here that we have business with or ought to know? Well, maybe no. It's myself could answer that for you. At the strange, crackled, young old voice, we both of us looked up in sudden shock. Halfway up the great curving oaken staircase, in a window niche, 
darkened by the storm outside, sat a small, hook-shouldered man in a dress of bygone days. He was all in green, save for his square, buckled black shoes. And he wore a truncated, conical hat with a wide brim that shadowed his face. Now, suddenly, using a little walking stick to support himself, he hopped down and came to us, saying... Is there some way now I could be of service? Well, uh, my daughter and myself were on our way to Cork. Uh, some way down the road, the, the, the bridge is out. Ah, uh, tis a most annoying bridge there, so it is. The one day there, the other nowhere. Uh, yes, but there must be some other somewhere so we can continue south. Do you know that is the only bridge exists anymore? You mean we're trapped? We either go back to the main route and back over all those mountains, or we wait till the bridge on the main route is repaired. Wait, well, now as to that, it's up to your honor and uh, our sense. If you was to ask me... Well, let, let's put it that I'm asking you. Well, then, I would trust the folk here about that the bridge would get put back to itself before the posterior of the day, as you might say. And in the meanwhile, what? would you suggest? Why, as to that, is up to your honor. With an hour or two to while away, you might be interested in a bit of the history of Carrick Moran. Uh, to, to make a lean purse a little fatter, it could make interest in listening. Could we... Uh, oh, forgive me, Papa. C could I see your purse? <laughs> sure. Little fear I have of showing what has a smart interest. <laughs> there it is, then, for honest work. <gasps> a shilling... Ah, uh, so it is. All oh, that's there. But if I took it from you, it would make no difference. Another one would take its place. <laughs> sure and all, you'd have me with one shoe in my hand is all, and busy remaking it at the same time. What are you two talking about? I think your daughter, if she be so, takes me, perhaps... For a leprechaun. <laughs> and what are you? Oh, just what I see, God save you then. A man minding his own business till you stumbled in in my privacy. Oh, forgive us. Ah, sure, Macushna, though it came on us, I'm not one bit ungrateful for the invasion, do you see? Ah, you're not one to go out in that. With the weather, what it is, maybe you'd like to perhaps hear the legend of Carrick Moran? <gasps> oh, yes. You have my daughter completely under your spell, Mr. Uh, I don't believe we've exchanged names or cards. Ah, there's no need for formalities here. We're all children of the fates. It was all ordained. Eh? Hmm? Hmm? So, hear my story now. Indulge an older man. Uh, what would you guess my years to be then, sir? <clears throat> well, it's hard to say. Um, the 50s? Middle, perhaps. Oh, yeah, yeah. A long, long span of years beyond that. <laughs> and a long, long span still to go. I've a way of thinking you were led to this door. And that what I have to tell you may affect the rest of your days. William Donovan does not entirely share his daughter's eager expectancy. He eyes his unexpected host with a much more puzzled eye. Who is he? And what is he? And some uneasy twinge deep within him even suggests to his practical mind that perhaps he has been wrong to deny the supernatural all his life. Maybe at last he has met up with it. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Three people sit in a melancholy, dusty old room of Carrick Moran Castle. The girl is young, lovely, and still pale from a recent tragedy in her life. Her father is a square-set, successful American businessman. The third is... We're in Ireland, the Emerald Isle. 
just before the dawn of the 20th century, halfway from Limerick to Cork, he affects the dress of the 18th century. Knee breeches and stockings, buckled shoes, wide lapels, and tails on his coat. Tis a story about the devil himself. Oh, you'd have to go back near a hundred years or so to just before the union of the English and the Irish. It was a time of trouble, you understand, and anyone who owned a property at all was after yearning for peace and stability, like the owner of this castle, who had a daughter the likes of you, my morning, with too much spunk and spirit for her own good. Why, damn the young rapscallion, I tell you, Marine, I'd put a bullet in him out of hand if he so much as shows himself near you again. But I love him, Father. How can you love a man who hasn't two pants to rub together? Oh, Jamie can't help it if he's poor. No more can I, so it seems. The more reason I'll not see you married to anyone who can't support you and keep a roof over your head. But I love him. And I love your mother who lies in the will of God confined to her bed. I'll not see her put forth from Carrick Moran as long as she lives. And what has Ma to do with me? We're in a bad way, daughter. The potatoes failed us. There are no men to work the bogs and bring in peats, and there's no money at all, at all. The only thing will save us all is Lord Connor and all the gold he offers. You're going to sell me to that fat old pig. I won't marry him. You'll do as you're told. Tis for your own sake and your mother's. Ah, oh, you should be ashamed, Da. Well, tis done and will not be changed, and it's Lord Connor you'll marry, or the devil himself will have us all. Ah, oh, it's you he should take and save the rest of us. Oh, there's a terrible thing for a daughter to say to her father. Oh, that's so terrible. He half owns you already. You might as well go all the way and make a pact with him to sell your soul entirely. Well, many a word is said in anger we'd all like to recall. And sure, a sweet Colleen bond the likes of Maureen never meant at all the sort of curse she laid on Sir Seamus, her father. Now, look, sir, if you think to entertain us with some thinly disguised version of the Faust legend about a pact with the devil, I'm afraid... No, Papa. No, let him go on, please. Oh, we can't leave anyway in weather like this. Or until the bridge is fixed. Uh, very well. Uh, you came down over Steve about a horror, of course. Now, uh, what? Oh, forgive me since you don't have the tongue. Over the mountains, I mean. Oh, yes. Then, on the way, you'd have passed where Moreau Wood used to be? Well, I wouldn't know. Ah, well, well, it is no matter, perhaps. Uh, but it was there that Padre Dunin and Maureen used to meet among the black thorn and the rowan with a carpet of buttercups and daisies spread at their feet and the song of lapwings and robins all around. Oh, Maureen, a kushla. Oh, Paddy, beloved. Oh, oh my own, my own. <laughs> What is it then? Tears? Why? Ah, oh, because I'm not your own. I can't ever be. My dad has promised me to Lord Connor. Well, that fat old toad, I'd as soon see a tie to some old boar hog that wallows in the mud. Ah, oh, don't blame Dad too much. He's about to lose Carrick Moran unless he can find enough money to save it. And he'd sell you for that? Oh, my mother is sick, Paddy. Sick to the heart. He has to protect her, too. He should have thought of that before he gambled away a fortune. Oh, Lord, if I only had some money. But how? How I'd sell my soul to the devil just to raise that it... That won't be necessary, Padre Dunin. Or if you won't leave my daughter alone, I'll be happy to send you there to join him at no cost. Stand aside, Maureen. Sir Seamus, I beg you, in all conscience... If you don't... had any conscience, you are trespassing on my property. You'll show yourself here once again, and I'll shoot you down like a poacher. Come, Maureen. No. No, no if I have to make the choice, I'll go with Paddy. You'll do as your father says, if that's her choice. 
then we'll face the future and find it some way. And as to you, sir, may the devil take the hindmost. Come, Maureen. Yes, Patty. I warn you, you're taking her in lust and against all the laws of man and God. As you forced me to, you made her choose. You'll never have her. I'll kill you first. You wouldn't the care. The devil, I wouldn't. Oh, 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 oh. No absolution. Oh, you've killed him. It's dead. Hey, on good riddance. That's the end of him. Only it wasn't, you see, the end at all. But only the beginning. Bad enough a daughter that first wept herself out and then took to her bed like her mother. Bad enough the dreams of tortured conscience that kept Sir Seamus awake night after night with his shame at the sudden blind rage that had made him pull the fatal trigger. But worst of all, the final outcome that it had all been for nothing. You lie. You'll have another round of port, Lord Connor. That no, sir. My gout is nagging at me enough already. What I will have, Sir Seamus, tonight for once is some converse with your daughter. In a pox on all the backings and feelings, I want her, sir, while I'm still capable. Well, now, you must understand that my daughter has been ill-disposed. That's it. Towards me? No, no, not toward you. I, I, I meant her health has been such that she is not ready to enter into a, a marriage contract. Damn, my <laughs> hide them at the last peak for herself, for one. Oh, I'm afraid that is not possible tonight, Lord Connor, but... It's some... quite possible. Well, Father, I'm here to speak for myself. Ah, well, Marie, you, you, you look pale, girl. You'd... Please, Lord Connor. I want to put an end to this farce. I want to put an end to silly dreams. Both for you, Lord Connor, and my father. I have been studying and discussing with Father Ignatius, and from his instruction have met the Holy Mother of the Sister of Mercy at the convent. I have been accepted as a novitiate. And after serving my term, I will become a nun in that order. But, but, but what about your mother? Girl? I have arranged with the sisters that she shall be nursed and cared for until she passes away. And uh, what about me? Oh, you are the last person, dear father, who should demand anything. Oh, from you me. don't care about Carrick Moran. You let her home go to ruins, or whatever parvenu wishes to pick it up at a bankrupt sale. Ah, oh, the only worldly possession I desired, my Paddy, you took away from me. I renounce everything else gladly and give myself to the service of God. I am not going to mince words, Seamus Moran. You tricked me and your daughter to toast me and by heaven, you shall suffer the consequences. Don't expect me to have any mercy unless your debts are paid in full to the hilt. I shall foreclose. No, oh, your lordship, if you could give me just a little time. Not a just... minute, not a second, sir. I shall be happy to crush you like an ant under my heel. Oh, Seamus was beset. His world was falling apart round him. He wrapped himself in his riding cloak and going down to the stables picked himself Ben, his favorite hunting horse, and galloped off into the early night. By twilight, he had tethered his horse and found himself in Moraw Woods, wandering on foot, a rope in his hands. Every step he took was as long as three, and as dark came down and the moon went riding, he was looking for a stout oak tree on whose branches... He could suddenly end it all. And then, standing facing him in a dapper glade, was the shape, if not the substance, of Padre Cotone. A fortunate meeting, Sir Seamus. Oh, since you're long dead and buried an ill one, I'm afraid, Padre. What brings you back seeking for me? 
Why, I would have thought it the other way. That perhaps you came seeking me. Since you can be nothing else but a specter, sure, you must know that I was not looking for you. Are you so sure? As of anything in my life, which I was about to take. And consign your immortal soul to the devil forever? As you did mine. I had nothing to do with your soul. I only saved my daughter from your mortal self. By putting the bullet in me at the moment, as you yourself said, of last. By dispatching me from this world without the comfort of extra mountain, clothed in all my sins, unshriven. The devil only claims his own. As he would if you were to take the rope. I warn you, you would regret it. I don't even wish you, my worst enemy, the eternal torment you wished on me. I had no wish to place such a punishment on you. I regret it, but, but what can I do? No, there's an interesting point. Since you yourself are doomed in any case, you could put off the awful moment and at the same time do the Christian act of saving me. And letting me go to eternal rest. It would be well worth your while. Oh, what do I care about you? You're only a shadow in my mind. A little more than that. Your conscience. But better still, by a trick of fate. Your benefactor. My benefactor? <laughs> How? Would you like to have a full and never emptied purse? To pay off all your debts? Save Carrick Moran for the future, perhaps persuade Maureen to leave the convent. I could offer you such a bargain. How? Oh. My soul for yours. A pact. I would find peace this moment, and you would not have to reap the whirlwind for as many years as you could manage to escape it. Seamus. What better chance have you ever been offered in your life? In the dusty old parlor room in the decaying castle, William Donovan and his daughter Constance are trapped in the enchanting spell of this ancient story, as I trust you will be also, long enough to wait till I return shortly with Act Three. outside the lichened walls of Castle Carrick Moran, and the evening sunlight glistens in the cobwebs that festoon downward from the ceiling, creating a magic background for the little green man with a hooked back, who leans on the silver head of his ivory-tipped cane as he spins his own web, an alluring and hypnotic skein that has enmeshed his American listeners. You're not going to suppose that Sir Seamus was about to accept a pig and a poke? Taken aback and awed for all he was at holding converse with a ghosty, a man he had shot himself in cold blood. No, there was still a mite of bargaining to be done. You'd uh, have to be a little more exact. I mean, what are the terms of the pact? Seamus, I've laid it out for you. I've got a patron now, as I'm trying to explain. Old Nick himself. Aye. Who else? You delivered me to him. And, and, and he's willing to take me for you. When you're ready, a better chance than I had, sure. Well, what does it mean when, when, when I'm ready? He'll make a compact fair and square. I'm authorized to act in my present master's behalf. You can make your own terms. A full purse that's never empty? Like the leprechaun who always has a shilling whenever he opens it. I, 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 I'd want a bag of gold on the same terms. You'd have it. And how long would I have it? How long would you ask for? No. There's the whole trouble, do you see? I'm willing. 
aren't allowed to make any reasonable bargain, even, even to giving you a dry run, as you might say, from now to the first of March. Here. Hey, what is that? A bag of gold coins. Oh, you know what they say about the devil's gold, that with the morning light it turns into pebbles, chips, and nutshells. It won't happen with this. How can I be sure? I am only a messenger, but I am empowered to say this. Take this money. Use it. It will multiply cards, rents, dice, however you use it. But mark this well, famous. By the end of next February, it'll vanish. Unless you meet me here again. Or my master. I can say no more. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, Paddy boy, wait, wait. There are still things to be said. But he was gone in a puff of smoke and the sharp smell of blown cinders and brimstone. Well, Sir Seamus went home to sad news that his wife had passed away. Oh, he would have been hard put to it to manage the funeral, except that his daughter arranged it all through the convent. And never a word he dared to say to her about Padraig and the devil's gold. But once his wife was laid to rest, oh, 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 he went back to his dicing and gaming and carousing. And then, all of a sudden, the last day of February was upon him. And his overseer came to him in great distress. I, I've just written over the whole estate. And forgive me for saying it, but it's a disaster. What disaster? Speak up, man. Speak up. There's a pestilence on the pigs and cattle. No rain has made the earth dry up. And not a rent can I collect. Uh, there's little to hold you through the rest of the winter. Oh, is that all? I've no worries. Attend me a minute. <laughs> I'll give you golden guineas to satisfy our debts. And just as soon as I open the bag, watch out for the gold now. We can... uh, gold, sir. Uh, these are nothing but pebbles. Pebbles? What? It's the 28th. Today's the last day of February. Oh, it is right. The morrow will be the first day of March, Your Honor. The start of a new month. Oh, the start of a new life. Or the end... Of an old one. Saddle up, Ben, for me, Moriarty. I'm, I'm going right now. The, 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 the tax collector will be back at sundown. Will your honor be there to talk to him? The last guinea's gone. Carrick Moran would follow it. Unless I turn up some fresh. But when will you be back? The question is not when. But if. And you'll know that within the next two hours. <laughs> Seamus, are you sure you should ride to Moreau Woods this day? Why, what do you know of where and why I'm going? I? Oh, not a thing. There's only a foot across my grave, lad. Oh, Whoa, wait a minute. Who, who, who's that coming up the parkway there? Sweet Mary, bless us. It looks like the little mistress herself with a nun driving the shay. Maureen, come from the convent? Today of all days. Ah, uh, hold Ben here while I talk to her alone. What? Maureen Nakushta, what brings you here? Oh, hello, Da. A sister Aloysia had to go marketing, and the Mother Superior gave me permission to visit a little with you on the way back. Oh, well, there, now it's, it's good to see you. Da. Oh, you look pale, though. Da. I had a vision last night when I was telling my beads, an angel that spoke to me and said you were in trouble. But when I asked if I could help, the vision only shook her head and said that it was a devil's choice at best, and perhaps it was the only chance for remission of your sins. Well, so what did you think you could do about it? Only to offer my prayers, and my help, and my love. If you'd offered them sooner and kept your love directed where it belonged, your father might not find himself with one foot buried in the wrong grave. Now just remember, what I do is in part for your sins. As well as for mine. Padraig. Padraig Dunin. 
Are you here at all? I mean, you see, Miss. Save us. Do you have to sneak up on a man like that? I was here, only you didn't see me. Padraig, I... I'm... I'm having second thought. Oh, now I wouldn't do that. There'd be the devil to pay for both of us then. Seamus, you have nothing to lose, for he'll get you in the end. But I have everything to gain, for I never should have been his slave. In the name of your daughter, take advantage of a pact you couldn't hope for otherwise. Oh, what, what, what terms? What, 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 what terms? That the bargain dates for seven years until March the 1st of that year. That you should have all the pleasures and the glory of the world and unlimited money to enjoy them. And, and, and when, when, when the lease is out? That is between you and the principal I represent. You must be merry, protect me. I'm out of hell. And that's the end of the story. Well, now, isn't it where it should be? Where everyone lived happily ever after? Not quite, Mr. Storyteller. What about Sir Seamus? Did the devil ever call to collect his due? Uh, there is an interesting aspect of the whole thing. Ah, oh, but sure, I, I've taken enough of your time, and, and something tells me the bridge will be fixed by now, and you can be on your way. So if we could just uh, settle up for the trouble we've all been to, to set things to right and uh, keep you entertained. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Who is all? Well, sure, the little folks that have done what has to be done. They all have to be compensated. Oh, yes, they all like to see a little of the color of gold. Otherwise, who knows, the repairs might take an awful length of time there and no one else to How would... much? I, uh, I was thinking in the neighborhood of, uh, a hundred guineas. A hundred guineas? Well, that's a fortune to an Irishman, perhaps, but a mere bagatelle to an American, our rich cousins. Oh, just a moment, Papa. What, Constance? I'm not leaving until I have the rest of the story. Now, what happened to Sir Seamus when the seven years were up? Do you don't know, that is an interesting tale. And why not let you have the rest of it, eh? For six years after that second visit to the woods, Sir Seamus prospered. Oh, he took to his old ways and never a dice table or a card game or a horse race that he wasn't about. <laughs> But then, as the seventh year began and dragged on and on, the fear of death gradually had him by the throat. The priest would have not to do with him, and finally he had no recourse but his daughter, Sister Cecilia now in order. And on a certain day, he was allowed to see her and to tell her the whole story and throw himself on her mercy. I can pray for you, but that will not be enough. Would... What else would you ask? There are just nine months left before your time comes due. Ah, perhaps that in itself is a signal. The cycle of life, reborn. Ah, you must renounce all worldly things. Fast and pray, as I will for you. And perhaps God in his infinite mercy will find a way to intercede. And so he did for all those long months. Till on that last day, February the 28th, his daughter, Sister Cecilia, the Maureen that was, received permission from the Mother Superior to sit with him the whole day and to fast and pray against the arrival of that dread hour. Oh, hum, hum, a sad sight, the once ruddy and stout Sir Seamus was, nothing but skin on bone and white as a haddock's belly. But the hour of midnight passed, and glory be to God, the fiend dared put in no appearance. And twas time for his daughter to leave. You've been saved, Da. Uh, thanks to you, daughter. No, thanks to your own fasting and prayer. I must leave you now. But I caution one thing. I, oh, what's that, Maureen? I've sprinkled holy water all about the edges of the house and a little bit of the garden back where you can walk. But something warns me. Never step outside, for you may not be safe. 
And so saying, she returned to her convent retreat. And Sir Seamus? Well, no, that wasn't all too simple. For, you know, there was a little mistake there, do you see? It happened to be leap year. So there was a whole day to go till the 1st of March, and the contract was due. So what happened? Say he just stayed on here at Carrick Moran and is still alive this day to tell the tale. That he waits for passing travellers sitting up there in his little window niche and ready to recite his story. So he can still live inside the magic circle of the house. And that when time for questions arise that are too many, he just... <laughs> Where did he go? Well, I'm damned if I know. He just disappeared, like a puff of smoke. Papa, you don't suppose that he is Sir Seamus and that... Oh, don't be ridiculous, darling. What, he'd have to be nearly 300 years old. Well, what is it, Papa? Do you know, if you keep me here any longer, I might begin to believe such nonsense. <laughs> this damned enchanted isle. So, that's the story, landlord. What do you make of it? Uh, no more nor less than I do every time I hear it. What do you mean, every time you hear it? Bless you, Miss Donovan. You'll not be the first that's come over the sleeve of Balahora and found that bridge closed. You mean that little man, whoever he was, is just a common bandit? Extorting money from unwary travelers? Well, now, as to that, I wouldn't know how to answer. I've never seen him myself, nor anyone I know still living in these parts. You mean he doesn't exist? Well, I don't... Uh, I didn't say that. Well, it cost me a hundred guineas. Tis better than losing your immortal soul. Well, you'll excuse me. I think I want it in the kitchen. Constance, I think we've been had. <laughs> oh, we can afford it. And whether or not we spend an afternoon with the dead... It's something we'll both have to talk about for the rest of our lives. A 300-year-old man, a shade from the past, a leprechaun with a glitter in his eye, or a master storyteller who waited for the right moment and the right audience to keep his coffers full of gold. What difference? William Donovan and his daughter will never know. Or for that matter, you and I. I'll be back shortly. interesting that the title most think best suits Era or Erin or Ireland is the Emerald Isle. Of course, it refers to the incredible green of the grass that grows there. But the cognomen was first applied in a poem written by a Dr. Drennan in the 18th century. It seems fitting to close today's tale with a quote from it. Nor one feeling of vengeance presume to defile the cause or the men of the Emerald Isle. Our cast included Russell Horton, Patricia Elliott, Cork Benson, Ian Martin, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall.